Well, good afternoon. And thanks for listening to Barrett for um, the, uh, he's like the hype squad, right? He's the guy who, who says, everybody to the front and let's cheer loudly and be good on television. So um, thanks for uh, pulling everybody forward and, and thanks to all, all of you for attending uh, this uh, great concert, the, the concert, um, this great conference, uh, right? I'm, I'm in concert mode now. Um, and, uh, and I think about what you've done over the last few days and um, I was just reflecting um, about the choice of place for a war literature and the arts conference and the beautiful Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And I think about this place combined with what the purpose of the conference is and how perfect it is, right? What a great setting for reflection, for discussion, for thought, for the sharing of ideas and the coming together of so many like-minded people um, who really want to understand the role of literature um, in the context of what we in uniform do um, as part of the profession of arms. And so, so thank you all for choosing to be here. And uh, thanks to our cadets also for coming today um, to be part of this. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this afternoon um, and to introduce Robert Olin Butler, um, our speaker. He is the Francis Epps Distinguished Professor holding the Michael Shara Chair in Creative Writing at Florida State University. He has published 16 novels, among them, a Good Scent from a Strange Mountain, which won the 1993 Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and Perfume River. And these text, texts are cornerstones of contemporary war literature. Professor Butler served in Vietnam from 1969 to 1971, first as a counterintelligence special agent for the Army, and later as a translator. He has been recognized by the Vietnam Veterans of America for outstanding contributions to American culture by Vietnam veterans. Over the past two decades, he has lectured in universities, appeared at conferences, and met with writers groups in 17 countries as a literary envoy for the US State Department. And his works have been translated into 21 different languages. Let me highlight some of his amazing awards. In 2013, he became the 17th recipient of the F. Scott Fitzgerald Award for Outstanding Achievement in American Literature. He also won the Richard and Hinda Rosenthal Foundation Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award. He has twice won a National Magazine Award in Fiction and has received two Pushcart Prizes. Robert has also received a Guggenheim, Guggenheim Fellowship. His stories have appeared widely in premier national publications, including The New Yorker and The Atlantic Monthly. They've also been chosen for inclusion in four annual editions of The Best American Short Stories, eight annual editions of New Sto Stories from the South, several other major annual anthologies, and numerous college literature textbooks. He also writes feature-like screenplays as well, um, and teleplays for HBO, and he also records audiobooks. Robert, I can say that on behalf of this group here, we are honored to share in this conference with you and to have you as this afternoon's presentation and to share your thoughts. We know from our conversation earlier that uh, we talk often about ways of knowing at the Air Force Academy, and today we get to hear your thoughts on literature and the arts as a way of knowing. Please join me in welcoming Robert Olin Butler. Thank you. I was just saying to Colonel Goolsby, known to me as Jesse, that um, I'd forgotten, I had, you know, consciously forgotten, not in my bones, but um, uh, I'd forgotten what a joy it is to be among you, among people that are focused in the way you are focused. I say this with absolute conviction. 
I would never have won a Pulitzer Prize. I would never have learned with anywhere near a comparable depth or nuance what I know about art, about love, about the universal human condition if I had not entered the United States military. As a 23-year-old, I began my final semester in the master's program in playwriting at the University of Iowa, expecting to proceed onward to a PhD. But it was the fall of 1968, a mere seven months after the massive Tet Offensive. And I was faced with the certainty of being called by my home draft board in those pre-lottery days as soon as I got my degree from the University of Iowa in February. So I went to my draft board and anticipated my graduation day by committing to a deferred enlistment, which allowed me a chance to test and qualify for a chosen military occupational specialty. I chose military intelligence. After graduating in February, I entered the US Army and went to Fort Lewis, Washington for basic training and then to Fort Holabird, Maryland, where I became an Army counterintelligence special agent. Many of my fellow classmates ended up in American field offices doing background security checks. But along the way, apparently another test I took gave the Army a different idea of what to do with me. I was sent to Washington, D.C. to learn the Vietnamese language. I studied seven hours a day, five days a week for a full year with a native speaker. It was a hard language for Westerners to learn because of its tonality. But I had a musical ear and I learned it well and when I landed at Tunsin Ute Air Base on my first day in country, I already spoke fluent Vietnamese. On my second day in country, I began to fall in love with the Vietnamese landscape and culture and people. Trained one way, however, I was deployed in a somewhat different way. I worked in tactical intelligence collection about 25 clicks northwest of Saigon near the Bien Hoa Air Base. My job was mostly involved with anticipating rocket attacks on the airbase. It was a richly intense time driving an army jeep through the rice paddies alone, full of, however, ongoing close contacts with Vietnamese farmers and woodcutters and fishermen and provincial police chiefs. But this was 1971. Some units were going home, and the 219th was one of them. By then, however, I'd made another close contact with a high-ranking American Foreign Service officer who was the advisor to the mayor of Saigon. He had me assigned to him as his administrative assistant and sometimes translator. So I spent my final seven months in Vietnam working in Saigon City Hall in a civilian clothes job. I lived in an old French hotel down Trung Hung Nau Street. And my favorite thing in the world was every night to put my 38 in the bottom drawer of the dresser, arm myself only with the Vietnamese language, and wander into the steamy back alleys of Saigon where nobody ever seemed to sleep. I would crouch in the doorways with the Vietnamese people. And they were the most warm and generous sp spirited people I'd ever met. They invariably invited me into their homes and into their culture and into their lives. I Vietnamized myself. Which is to say, the Vietnamese people opened me up to the essence of our shared humanity. Then my tour ended and so did my three years in the US Army. I would go on, not to a PhD, but to New York City, where I worked myself upward at a major business publisher to be the creator, eventually, and the editor-in-chief of an investigative, hard news-oriented weekly newspaper in the energy field, born of the mid-70s oil embargo. 
I lived on Long Island and began to write novels by hand, on legal pads, on my lap, while commuting on the Long Island Railroad. My experience in Vietnam was already at work in me. It had transformed me from playwright to fiction writer. Those ravishing five months in the Vietnamese countryside and seven months in the back alleys of Saigon helped make me understand that the intense flow of life in its moment-to-moment -moment sensual direct way had to be the stuff of whatever art form I worked in. And those experiences on the far side of the world, in the military, in a war, shaped, informed, energized, and guided my creative process, and eventually shaped as well the ways I taught that process in university writing programs, which I've now done for 20, well, 20, 34 years. I'd like now to briefly share one of the most important of those insights about the fiction writing process. It's the key to the narrative kingdom, it seems to me. Every art form has characteristics that are essential to it. Color and form in painting, movement in dance, sound in music, Fiction is, of course, made up of language, but it has three other fundamental characteristics as well. Fiction is about human beings, and fiction is about human feelings. It is about the human heart, not the analytical mind. But there is one more inevitable characteristic. Fiction exists in time. A poem, which is also made up of language, can operate in a very real way apart from time. And a poem's characteristic line length makes the kind of object on the page. But when you let the line length run on and you turn the page, you are, as they used to say in storytelling, upon a time. And any Buddhist will tell you, it's one of the great truths of their religion, that you cannot be a human being with feelings on planet Earth for even 30 seconds of time without desiring something. Not incidentally, my Buddhists were monks who befriended me at their temple, which I frequented in my night of wandering in Saigon. And they knew we are all of us, always, in small ways and large, creatures of desire. I prefer the word yearning for literature as it suggests the deepest level of desire, which is where literary fiction strives to go. Fiction ultimately is the art form of human yearning. Indeed, what is plot anyway, that most basic craft concept in narrative? Plot is simply yearning, challenged and thwarted. In recent years, my awareness and teaching of this insight has led onward to an understanding of a sort of, um, you might call, unified field theory of yearning. A simple statement that will say everything. When, when I came to this theory, I also realized that my path to this understanding began in Vietnam, as so many of my paths have. So, before I give you the theory, let me step us back to Vietnam for a moment. My experience there was unusual in my speaking the language, but it was quite common in another way. Approximately 80% of the soldiers who went to Vietnam never engaged in what we would recognize as classic combat. That 80-20 split is typical of all modern armies, and I have a hunch that in the Air Force, it's probably closer to 90-10. The non-combat and support personnel always far outnumber the actual weaponized warriors. But in Vietnam, even the base camp bound soldiers were in daily contact with Vietnamese nationals. 
from latrine canister burners to Arvin counterparts, from laundry girls to short timers to local tradespeople. So for that 80%, though everyone was always on edge, though random violence was always possible, the daily life of the war was not about armed conflict. It was not about life and death. It was about the collision of cultures. American soldiers had an ongoing, vivid new awareness of a fundamental human question. Who is your own? And who is the other? And it was the same for civilians who watched the war on television, who lived it divisively in our country, in our communities, and our families. For Americans on the home front, the Vietnam War gave a fierce new life to that same eternal question. Who do we need to care about as if they are our own? Not just abroad, but home as well. And from this understanding, and from my own moment-to-moment -moment experience, the Vietnam War eventually led to my deeper understanding of the beating narrative heart in literary fiction, my unified field theory, which is, if you carefully examine the yearning of the central character of almost any work of fully realized literature, down beneath the closer to the surface goals and objectives, down to the deepest yearning, you will find that the central character yearns for a self, yearns for an identity, yearns for a place in the universe. Not incidentally, this theory unifies as well that other 20% with the 80% in Vietnam and in all wars. It seems to me the deepest challenge of the horrors of combat is the one that assaults the combatant's sense of self. After I have witnessed these things, after I have done these things, who is left within me? Who am I now? Where do I belong? And I believe this unified field theory of yearning is true of literature because it is true of this mortal life for all of us, for everyone. Every morning, every soul on this planet wakes up and looks in a mirror. It may be a real mirror, it may be a metaphorical mirror. It, uh, they, they, may not, they may be quite aware of looking in the mirror and, and they may be unaware of it. But we all look every day in that mirror and we say, who the hell are you? It's the great who the hell am I that writes the plot of our lives. Look at the flashpoints in our culture. Race, gender, ethnicity, religion, nationality, politics, sexual preference, to name a few. Take a step back from all these things. What are they? They are prefabricated answers to that fundamental question. Who am I? I'm black. I'm white. I'm a man. I'm a woman. I'm gender fluid. I'm a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, a Buddhist. I'm an atheist. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I'm an American. I'm a Marine. I'm a sailor. I'm an airman. But even as we cling to those answers, we yearn on because our identities are far more complex than any one of those. And yes, the US military taught me all this, not unintentionally. I happen to think our modern military from the Second World War onward, at least, evolved into the greatest military in the history of humankind. I'm speaking of the military itself, which sometimes has to deal with our flawed humanity on an individual basis within its own chain of command, from the bottom to the top. 
has to deal with flaws personal, it deals with flaws political, and it does so with necessary, complex caution. This speaks to me as well of the greatness of our military. And at the heart of that greatness is the profound irony of its intrinsic humanity. We see that humanity in how our modern military readily takes on allies, not because of their strength, but because of their vulnerability. How our military exposes those of us who serve in it to a deeper engagement with and connection to the otherness of the world. How our military educates its leaders in this great institution, for example, educates them not only in the ways and means of war, but in the way that other nations, other peoples yearn for an identity. A yearning whose pursuit is dependent on safety and freedoms that it has long been our mission to defend. As a member of the United States military, that is an inextricable part of your identity. That is part of who you are. Now let me share some of my words that I care most about. Fictional ones, narrative ones, yearning ones. I trust you will see their relevance as well to all the words I've said so far. In 2016, I published Perfume River, my seventh book in which the Vietnam War or its aftermath plays a major role. Perfume River is at its heart about the boomer generation, its families and its wars. But only one shot is fired in the present time in the book, which is 2015, and only two shots are fired in memory. The novel is as well about secrets in families, especially the secrets held by the men of families about the wars they fought. And the novel is about how the past is always with us, always in deep dialogue with the present. The book began without my realizing it when I wrote two brief short stories, which I thought were independent when I wrote them, but they led inexorably to the novel. And I'm going to read them to you. The first one is called Banyan. I know what's happening. I wake and it's dark and a woman is beside me naked and small, and she is waking too, and the room is still heavy with the incense she burned for her dead. My job is to count men, weapons, but I never see the men except unknowingly, the political cadre in this city. They are here looking like everyone else in Hue, and I hear the weapons only from afar. I hunker in to do my order of battle work at the MACV compound on the south bank of the Perfume River, and in my few months, there have been just the horizon sounds, but I knew no to recognize the singular pop of the enemy's AK-47s, and now I hear them nearby, and the night is coming alive with sounds of other weapons that I have known only on paper. I'm wrong, wait, listen, it's quiet the night. It is in fact quiet as I awake, and the only sound is the racing of my heart, the pop of it in my ear, and I am back in the world, and I am old. I left Vietnam long ago, and I am old, and my hand gropes toward the naked girl. I can't even say her name right, but it means flower, and she is not here. I turn my face to the window, my live oak is jaundiced with the security light, and beyond it the sky is black. This past year I have stretched out my hand to my wife a hundred times in the night, and she is not here. She is gone. I could not imagine her dying before I die. 
I did not expect to live past that night in Hue. Tet, 1968, the New Year offensive by the North, and I ran. I was six blocks away from the compound. I put on my pants and I did not even look at her. I was in her little room. I bought her drinks at the bar. I, I bought her. And I realize that my hand is still extended to touch her. I have reached in the night to touch a Vietnamese bar girl instead of my wife, and they are both dead. My wife Maggie and the bar girl named Flower. I dare say she is dead. And I pull my arm back quickly, my left arm, and my face is flushed with shame. My throat clutches with shame at my betraying my wife tonight, even if it began in a dream. My arm aches with shame. And I understand. I am dying. The pain is beginning to run down my left arm. My throat is clutching. It is not from shame. I sit up. I will die. And I put my pants on and my shoes. And I do not look back at my bed. And the girl named Flower does not speak. And I am down the back stairs and into the dead fish stench of the alley. And the AK-47s are popping nearby from across the river. The Viet Cong, or maybe even the North Vietnamese regulars. We don't know jack shit about them for all our counting. The enemy is taking the Imperial Palace. I go out into the street and far down in the street lamps along the river, I see the men moving. The men I count. I am a dead man. I turn and I run in the direction of Mac V. I run. I put my feet on the floor. I know the signs. I know my heart. I can call 911. I rise and I am unsteady and I move across the room and out the door and along the hall and I am at the top of the stairs and I hold tight to the banister and I descend and I am in my own backyard. And before me is a live oak, my live oak, a hundred years old, 200 maybe. And I will live 200 more. And I knew it would someday need to hold me. Its arms are open wide. The lower horizontal branches thick as most trees, thick as water oaks and pin oaks. And I go to it and I turn my back to it and I sit heavily down in the crotch of two roots and I press back against the, my tree even as my chest begins to clench and the oak's trunk is rough. It touches me hard in the back in long uprunning ridges and I am rushing past the bar fronts, dark now, and past the passageways into rear courtyards and past the smells of mildew and dead fish and the smell of wood fires and from all directions now comes the din of weaponry, of small arms and RPKs and the whoosh and suck and blare of rockets. The sky flaring beyond the palace walls. They are hitting Taylor, the city airport to the north. And now I see men before me as well. A squad of dark clothed men, a block up the river, and gunfire is crackling everywhere. And now a needle thin compression of air zips past my head, drills past me very near, and I lunge into an alley mouth. And I am running hard, and figures are coming to doorways, and I think the local communist cadres are emerging. I think again that I am dead and there is only darkness around me and the alley slime underfoot and I push hard and if I am to die I'd rather not see it happening so I don't look right or left or feel any of the bodies coming out I just run and I run and I am out of the alley and I am in a pocket park and there is a great dark form before me a banyan tree the pain drills down my left arm like a rifle round. The shooter is in my chest, in the center of my chest. I lift my head. I let it go back against the live oak. And I approach the banyan. It is old and it is vast. Its aerial roots are thick as trees and nuzzled together into a dense forest propping up a billowing dark sky of leaves. And there is a deep inner curve to the roots and a turning and in the direction of the MACV compound. There is heavy small arms fire now and I hear the AK-47s and I hear the answering M16s and I know where I belong. I enter the tree. I move into the turning and I put my back to its roots and I sit and I draw my legs into me and I am in the dark. 
I can see around the outcurving columns of roots. Bodies appear, nearly as dark as the night, moving quickly past, and I pull my head back, squeeze into myself. I close my eyes and smell a dank, wet earth smell, and a faint smell beneath, an almost sweetness, and a little sharp thing in the nose, and I think of the girl's incense and the dead she prayed for. I know this tree has killed another to live. These roots around me, holding me in the dark, began long ago by wrapping themselves around another tree. The strangler roots, embracing a living tree until it vanished, until it was dead inside the growing banyan. Rifles flare nearby, and I press back into the killing embrace of the banyan. I expect never to leave. And I lay my head upon my live oak. I am glad for its hardness against me. And I am glad to smell the damp Georgia earth around me. And the squeezing in my chest begins, the deep clamping in my chest. I am glad I am in my own country now. But I was sent to Vietnam. And I know this was meant to happen long ago, long, long ago. So that was the first of the two stories I wrote. That one appears in the novel in a form greatly elaborated on, but much as you heard it, some serious changes. But. All right, this story is called AWOL. I, these were two commission stories, one from Granta Magazine. They said, write something about nature. <laughs> write something about going away. Conjunction Magazine, AWOL. You can see what was in my unconscious. The night my mother died, I was sleepless in a hotel room in Miami. From what Stan, Dr. Sparkman, tells me, from what the nurses told him, I figure I was awake at the moment she passed. I wasn't there, but I was awake. Before I left her, Stan assured me she could live on as she was for a long, indefinite period. If it was at all important, I should go ahead to Miami. So I came down to say goodbye to the stockholders, and they stood up and applauded in thanks and regret at my passing, at my retirement. He built all this for us from nothing, they said. What a guy. She was demented. Not at first. She broke her hip in assisted living in a nice place in Buckhead where my dad had died a few years earlier. She was standing in the center of her living room floor and she was 92 years old and she was talking to a nurse, trying to explain Bach to her, which was filling the room at the time in which the nurse had asked her about. And my mother up and fell, just like that. And her hip was broken. Stan says the breaking of the hip likely preceded the fall. But there it is. When her surgeon the next morning warned me that one person out of two over 80 years old who breaks a hip dies within six months, I thought my mother would beat those odds if anyone could. She didn't. She broke her wrist as well. She couldn't rehab the hip. So she spent the rest of her life flat on her back in a nursing home. Another nice place up in Buckhead with me just 20 minutes away, mostly downtown in the Georgia Pacific Tower, helping the oil fields and construction sites of the world manage their risks. She moved from hospital to nursing home with a clear mind. I went into a swoon over an adagio is what happened, she said. Her very first words when I sat down beside her bed, her never having thought to explain in the hospital. She was buttoned up to the throat in her flannel pajamas, the institutional blankets smoothed over her, and the bed cranked up so she could read. 
we brought the stand-up wrought iron lamp that had stood by her reading chair for as long as I could remember. From the Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 1, she said. I said, Dad always thought Johann would do you wrong. She extracted her right hand from beneath the covers to slap me lightly on the wrist. Your father and I had an understanding about me and Herr Bach. I caught her hand before she could take it away, and I held it. She turned her face away from me. Do I smell of piss, she said. A little bit, I said. I am in diapers, she said, her face coming back to me. But they better not talk to me as if I were a child. I think they realized that, I said. The nurse said she liked your spirit. They ain't seen nothing yet, she said. I squeezed her hand gently. She took it away. The gentleness felt patronizing to her. She didn't say so, but she looked me hard in the eyes for a moment. Then she softened. You got your drive from me, you know, she said. Not from dad, from her. She was right. I know, I said, and I'm grateful. I didn't take up her hand again, though I had the urge. She was fine. She was who she was when she first moved from the hospital to the nursing home. She taught me to drive myself. I learned things elsewhere as well. I just wished I'd been smarter about applying them. The dementia was beginning by the next time I saw her, less than a week later. I didn't recognize it. In my first visit, I'd hung a framed print on the wall beyond the foot of her bed. She wanted to see it always. Van Gogh's Starry Night. Bach's Adagio spoke to what she always hoped for in herself, but I doubt ever really found. The painting was what she lived with always. Even a quiet night of church spire and olive tree, of rooftops and mountains, of clouds and moon and stars, even these were roiling, ever roiling, caught up in a ceaseless vortex of anxiety. She nodded at, to the painting. Your father went out there last night and he hasn't come back, she said. I laughed softly. I don't care, she said. He needs to walk more. I took it all as an imaginative little riff on her disaffection with my father, a common theme ever since he died in hospice care in their assisted living apartment shortly after their 65th anniversary. But in fact, she meant it literally. As this thing in her brain began to spin more rapidly, she would often begin our visit by pointing him out to me. There he was beside the olive tree, or on the mountain slope, or at the church door. I had to see him wandering out there before she would go on. And then she'd swirl on to me how I was about to ruin her life and mine by letting myself go off to war. She was convinced. She was unremitting. I could never figure out how simply to stay quiet or deflect her. It would follow much the same script each time. She says, please don't go. I say, it's all over. I'm back. We should leave the Vietnamese alone, she says. That all ended decades ago. You can still run away. There's no need anymore, I say. You can go to Canada. Your father and I can visit you. Ma, I say using the softest name for her, but the sharpest tone she'll tolerate. The Vietnam War is over. I'm back and I'm safe. Don't leave me, she says. I can't bear it. I'm here. A year would feel like a lifetime, she says. Ma, I say. You'll die over there, she says. You'll die alone. And sometimes she got stuck on the part about her being left alone. At least that would shift her sense of time back to the present. But the big problem with her being left alone in the nursing home was that there was so much for her to do in the middle of the night. The nurses needed her help, and she tried and tried, but she didn't know how. I heard this last theme for weeks before it made sense. How stupid I'd become. I was an intelligence lieutenant in Vietnam. For the first few months, I ran a little all-purpose shop out of Plantation, about 30 clicks up Highway 1 from Saigon. When we interrogated suspects, I always had my boys play it by the book. But it was 1971. Units were standing down. 
Five months into my tour, our unit went home and I got reassigned up country into I Corps. The first CAV had just stood down up there and everyone was very nervous, butt to butt as they were with the North. I ended up working under a captain who had long ago stopped playing it by the book. We were in a field office within smelling distance of the Gulf of Tonkin, and the thing that finally came back to me in the nursing home was a night during that summer of 71. A young Charlie in black PJs was caught with wire cutters and a couple of grenades on our perimeter. They took him to be a sapper. He might have been an unfriendly, but from how easy they grabbed him and from his measly arsenal, he was no proper sapper. Didn't make any difference in those days. He was locked in the back in our interrogation room, which was bare except for a cot and a piss pot and a chair. And I pulled the midnight to dawn shift, sitting at the captain's desk in the front of the shop, reading cast off paperbacks and sending in an MI sergeant to wake up our Charlie every hour. Just wake him up thoroughly. This went on around the clock. It was as simple as that, the method. Never let him finish a dream. You had to grill him good in the first 24 hours because by the second day he was utterly disoriented and by the third day he was hallucinating pretty much all the time. As it was, we never got three coherent sentences in a row out of this guy, much less useful intelligence. But the captain sure was one hell of a tough guy interrogator. So one afternoon, near the end of the third month of my mother's failing mind, she was explaining to me how she really needed some help in the middle of the upcoming night, either from me or my dad. Hadn't she always been there for us when we needed her? Because she was going to have to do the work of ten nurses, and they didn't even give her a sponge in a bucket. And abruptly, I knew. I went out of the room and down to the nurse's station and I asked what the procedure was in the night. What did they do to take care of her? She was the peroxided, ready-to-retire head nurse with a serious groove between her eyebrows that instantly furrowed deeper. Something wrong, she said. I remembered enough about interrogation from 40 years ago to hear that tone of voice and let her tell me what was wrong. What do you think, I said. She was clear last night, she said. Are you sure? Diaper rash can come on quick, she said. We love your mother. We're vigilant, I assure you. I nodded. Diaper rash. I could well imagine. For the state inspections of nursing homes, this must be an obvious objective measure. And I bet the lawyers of litigious family members love a slideshow of diaper rash for the judge. And what do you do to prevent it, I said. The head nurse straightened in her chair and relaxed her brow and announced, we check her diaper every two hours, day and night. Day and night, I said. Yes, sir, she said. You go in every two hours through the night and wake her to check her diaper. She goes right back to sleep. Stan, who doesn't do nursing home rounds, but took my mother on as a favor to me, was appalled at the procedure and leaned on the home management to put her on a bedtime and rising diaper routine. She lasted another three months and not once got the rash, but her mind was so fucked over by then she never recovered. I awoke thinking it was something in the room. Then it was something outside, some sound, but there was only silence. I knew at once where I was, no confusion, no flashbacks. The hotel sat on Brickell Key, and my balcony looked across a riverside slice of Biscayne Bay at the south downtown Miami skyline. Nothing out there would make a sound at this hour. I sat up, pulled the covers back, put my feet on the floor. Where was I going? Nowhere, just to a sitting position with my feet on the floor. Back to Atlanta in a few hours. I'd been gone barely 36. The last time I saw my mother alive 
She was sleeping hard at noon, even though I was beside her. Not a coma. She'd wake up, but only enough to turn her eyes to me. She'd stop talking. The last time she woke, she spoke to me. The last time she spoke to me, two days before, she lifted her hand for mine as I was about to go back to the office. And she held on tight. And she said, Kenny. And my name struck me as if for the first time, as if she'd only just then named me. She said no more. She let go. I went out. But sitting on the side of the bed in the hotel room in Miami, I knew what she wanted to say next. Don't go. Thank you. Thank you. Butler. Thank you so very much for sharing the, um, your experiences with us. Um, we only have time for one question, and I've begged Lieutenant Colonel Goolsby to allow me to say it, and I have the microphone in my hand. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to approach you as a, uh, a former Army intelligence officer who served in interrogation operations in Operation Iraqi Freedom. And I'd like to discuss with you and ask you about the notion of Phuong, which, if I'm not mistaken, means Phoenix in, oh, yeah. uh, in Vietnamese. 2016, uh, as a former inter intelligence officer, I, I took it upon myself to fly down to Hanoi for a weekend from Korea to see what it looked like. Um, what what I year again was that? Uh, 2016. 2016. What I didn't realize, it was the anniversary, the day of, of the fall of Saigon. And I very clearly stuck out, and I had many Vietnamese come up to me buying me beers saying, we beat you. <laughs> Which is arguably true. Um, but I'm also, I'm interested in the young Robert Owen Butler and in front of these cadets who are going to serve in uh, now our nation's longest war. Um, to me, and this is not to be reductive, you strike me a, a bit um, as a sort of a fowler and a pile from Graham Greene's <laughs> The Quiet of a Quiet American, perhaps my favorite novel. This notion of Fuong, the nation that you fell in love with and you spent your life uh, writing about, and what it is now. There's now a Popeye's chicken when you show up at the airport in Hanoi. Dunkin' Donuts, if you want it, the effects of capitalism and globalization mirrored against the millions dead and 58,000 of our fellow brothers and sisters. The notion of what Cronkite called an unwinnable war and where we are right now in the global war on terror. So your thoughts on Fong, time, and personal reconciliation in these conflicts? Um, Fong, you mean the Phoenix program? Hmm? Yeah. Well, I didn't work with the Phoenix program. I, the military intelligence um, mission was separate from that. That was the CIA boys, and 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 um, and th that was a that was a different th thing that I had no personal experience with. But I mean the the, the literary theme of Fuong, the, the rising from the ashes. Oh, the rising, oh, just that that aspect of yes. it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it doesn't surprise me in the least because we never understood from the get go who the Vietnamese people were. The the humanism that that we now have in, a, in the military more and more is so crucial because, and that's why I invoked the flaws in the chain of command bottom to top. Because at the top, I was under Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger and before that, jo Lyndon Johnson and the prevailing um, belief was in the domino theory, if you recall. And as soon as we, if we let the communists take over Vietnam, uh, then immediately China would control Vietnam and the dominoes would begin to fall, Cambodia and Thailand and the rest. Um, 
we did not understand who these people were from, from the beginning. First of all, in 1954, Ho Chi Minh went to, um, well, actually before that, um, Ho Chi Minh, f for as long, in, about in the late 40s even, thought that America, because of our Declaration of Independence, would understand his aspirations for Vietnam to be an independent nation. He was not a communist at that time. He was a poet. And he approached, um, eventually, America. He thought uh, that we would understand that, but, um, but uh, we didn't. And um, we, our, we were beholden to France and, and helping it maintain its, its colonial property. Only after we um, turned him aside in his aspirations, um, did he go to Moscow and enlist their help and the trappings of it? But the, the Vietnamese are a profoundly uh, pragmatic people and always have been. And even as all that was going on, every city and village in Vietnam, virtually every one, had a statue to a Vietnamese hero. And that hero, and, and by the way, the, that domino theory was behind it. And we, it wasn't just allegiance to France, but that, you know, if we let France, uh, 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 after France left, then that was a vacuum. And by the time that we made that bad decision, the, the dominant theory began after Ho did what he had to do. But we, we didn't understand that in every village and town in that, in that country, there is a statue to a Vietnamese hero who is a hero because he th they th threw out the Chinese. The ch they had had 2,000 years of Chinese invasions. And all their national heroes were those guys that, that repelled the Chinese, got rid of them. And indeed, when Ho Chi Minh, <coughs> uh, when the French finally left and Ho Chi Minh declared um, the uh, independence of Vietnam, in Hanoi, he read a Declaration of Independence. And if you translate it from the Vietnamese, it is virtually word for word the Declaration of Independence to our, constitu to, to our Constitution. He loved Thomas Jefferson. It was those, those principles that he that sent him to us first. So, you know, it, they didn't rise from the ashes, they, you know, in a sense. Yeah, they did f in a material way, but they were always that people. And, if you, and I'm sure you felt their pragmatism in that bar. Never, you know, I've been back four times and there has never been a second of, of, um, of reproach or even of sideward glance. Um, and um, I'll make a little confession to all of you. Um, it's a confession I'm sort of proud of. Um, because uh, when I went into those back alleys of Saigon, there was a wonderful little bar at the end of one of the alleys, and there were always guys in there hanging around, and, you know, and I would go in, and, and you must understand this. This is absolutely, literally true. In every place I went, the war was never discussed. It was, you know, our families and our, and our mythos and... Um, it, it was um, it, it was an extraordinarily it was a kind of s area of separate peace. I didn't realize how much because when I went back in 1994 on a Guggenheim Fellowship to Vietnam, I went back into those back alleys and things looked some things looked different, some things looked the same. And by golly, there was that little bar, and I went in and. You know, this was 23 years later. And um, there was an old man in there who seemed vaguely familiar to me. And I was to him. And we embraced, and we sat, and we spoke, and we talked again. And he confided something in me. That all those nights in the back alleys of Saigon, when I was there, 
During that same during that time, that bar was the prime meeting place for all the Viet Cong in Saigon. What a great intelligence officer I was. Huh? <laughs> but we had that separate peace among us. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, if I speak longer than 30 seconds, I'm going to cry. Um, so, um, on behalf of the United States Air Force Academy, on behalf of the Dean and Colonel Harrington, uh, the Department Head of English and Fine Arts, and I hope on behalf of all of you, uh, I want to thank Robert Olin Butler for coming here. What amazing reading, and personally, what an amazing mentor uh, for me uh, for many years. So please join me, and we're giving him the bird from the Academy. Please join me in one final rousing applause for Bob Butler. <laughs>